Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, The Next Generation of Micro-Atomic Clocks for Defense Applications, hosted by Arolia. My name is John Fisher. I'm the VP of Advanced R&D at Arolia. And today, we are fortunate to be joined by three other very interesting speakers. Um, I will advance, uh, let's see, I would like to, there we go. We can advance and you can see our speakers, wonderful. Our first speaker will be Will Bowder. He is the Senior Physical Scientist at the Government Accounting Office, the GAO. Our second speaker will be Gregor Jackson, President of Jackson Lab Technologies. And our third speaker will be David Garrigan, Director of Engineering at Aurelia Defense and Security. Um, before we get started, I just I would like to do a little uh, housekeeping um, thing, the little things to let you know. And again, I have a screen to advance here, which doesn't see, there we go. There, there. So the, um, uh, that's our, our, our agenda. Um, the housekeeping items are first, this webinar is being recorded. For those of you that registered, we're not uh, able to join, you should be able to view this uh, on our website at a later time. Um, we encourage you to submit questions during the meeting. Um, the, um, uh, we, we received a number of, of great questions already that uh, uh, you all uh, submitted at registration time, so we're going to cover those, but if there's time, we'll also answer as many ones that we have in, in real time. Um, um, if for some reason you lose your connection uh, to this meeting, you can always join again using that same uh, meeting. So um, the, I guess the, the uh, if I go down to the next slide, no, it's not advancing, so there we go. Um, the uh, uh, first speaker, Will, will be talking about requirements, challenges, and options for PTP in in DOD, covering, I think, some of the recent report that the GAO, a uh, little study that they've done. Um, uh, uh, Jackson Labs will give us uh, uh, a presentation about using miniature atomic clocks to enable and enhance assured PNT applications. So we'll, we'll learn, uh, I think we're going to learn a lot from that one. And finally, David Garrigan will be giving us a presentation on a successful implementation of a mini rubidium for a battlefield application. So uh, after we do that, hopefully we finish that up in time that we have maybe about 10, 15 minutes to cover uh, a Q&A from the audience. And so we'll get started. Uh, but first, before we start, um, let's do a poll. And so um, let's, I think a poll question will be coming up. And there we go. Um, how familiar are you with atomic clocks? So please just select one. Either you're not familiar at all, you're somewhat familiar, or you're very familiar. So if you folks can all answer that question, um, that'll help us also help our speakers kind of um, uh, direct their, their presentations to understand whether they can be keep things very fundamental or more advanced. So um, please make your entry there and we'll look forward to some results. Give it just another, another few seconds. Maybe we need some, some music to, uh, while, we're, while we're waiting for the results. And there are results, okay, all right, so we have some good familiarity here. It looks like uh, over 90% of our people at least have some familiarity with atomic clocks. Um, and and uh, so uh, a few there. So, okay, I think that'll be wonderful because there is some very detailed information to be shared here. So uh, without uh, further ado, uh, Will, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks, John. And uh, thanks for the invitation to uh, to speak here today. Um, as John mentioned, I'm, uh, my name is Will Bowder. I'm with the Government Accountability Office. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we're a legislative branch agency that works directly for Congress. And one of the uh, products we produce 
uh, for Congress and for the public are our technology assessments, which take a broad look at a specific technology area and uh, potential policy options surrounding that. So I'm gonna to talk today a bit about some of the points from our recent uh, report looking at the DOD's efforts to develop alternative PNT technologies. Um, and specifically, this is report GAO 20-21-320SP, if you're interested in looking it up uh, later. And I'll be talking just at, I'll be talking at a high level just about some of the challenges of requirements related to Alt-PNT, a bit of our findings related to timing and clocks, uh, given the subject matter of, of our other panelists, and, and then some of the broader uh, challenges uh, that we identify. So uh, sort of the context of all of this is that there are threats to GPS. Um, GPS has been an incredibly successful system, but there are threats that exist, including jamming, spoofing, physical attacks, and even just sort of uh, non-nefarious line of sight issues uh, that can affect it. And so the quintessential challenge then when you're looking at alternative uh, uh, position navigation and timing is really that we heard over and over again in our, our review was uh, really summed up by this nice quote in DOD's 2020 PNT SMT roadmap, which is no single PNT system is capable of supporting all DOD PNT requirements. So if you have this great GPS system, but it's vulnerable and you don't have a clear uh, you know, replacement for it, what, what can you do? And so um, the framework that, that DOD kind of operates in and they're looking at the research is, is that um, they will have uh, GPS will be the cornerstone technology, and then you will develop a set of technologies that complement it. Um, and our report looked at a variety of these technologies, and we kind of broke them down into two broad categories, which we call uh, relative and absolute PNT. So relative PNT, we're talking about onboard sensors that can keep track of a position or keep time on a platform without an external signal. So an inertial sensor or a clock, essentially. Um, and then an absolute PNT signal would be some would be a source other than GPS that uses an external signal to provide you a geolocated position. We looked at a number of different technologies, including automated celestial navigation, uh, magnetic navigation, and a variety of different uh, non-GPS radio frequency sources. And, and the, the paradigm is that these technologies really work together so that you have a sensor on board that can keep your PNT information without if, if you lose GPS, and then you have these absolute PNT signals, which can sort of provide periodic resets. And I think as some of the later speakers will talk about, about holdovers and clocks specifically. Um, and, and so the everyday analog that we have, which uh, there's a, a photo down here, a picture down here from our report that we use is, is the, the cell phone. The modern day smartphone uh, sort of uses this paradigm where it has GPS, but if you're in the middle of a city and you lose line of sight to GPS, uh, the position information might get degraded. So you have also cell phone assist, uh, cell tower assisted positioning for that. And then there are also onboard inertial sensors so that all three of these things can sort of work together to provide a consistent um, uh, PNT information. So I'll just talk briefly about some of the concepts we looked at uh, with, with, that DOD is looking at with clocks specifically and with timing. So if you have this diverse challenge, you have these diverse platforms with, with different requirements, um, you, you really have to look at multiple different technologies. So a couple of broad avenues we looked at DOD is pursuing is the first is looking at low power chip scale atomic clocks. These are great devices to put into portable platforms like a handheld radio but they historically have lower precision than, than GPS and, and limited uh, time that they can maintain accurate time. So DOD is looking at efforts to say, hey, how can we improve these by improving the algorithms or improving the manufacturing of components uh, to, to uh, make these a more ubiquitous uh, and more useful uh, tool. On the other end, you have a high precision, uh, what we call an optical clock. So, uh, that could provide the GPS level timing, but then it's the trade-off is in power and size. This is a rack mounted unit. And so that might be applicable for a forward command center, but you're not gonna be able to have that kind of precision in a more compact uh, platform. And then the uh, sort of the ideal you'd like to split these two, you'd like to have a high precision, low power clock. And there are efforts that DOD is looking at in that, uh, redesigning their chip scale architecture uh, to be able to achieve a higher precision. 
Uh, but one of the things we've, we've found in, in some of these efforts is that you run, they've run into uh, challenges in manufacturing some of the specialized components, such as vacuum chambers and light sources. And so you're potentially limited by the, the manufacturing of these capabilities, even if you have sort of the design that works. And the need for these components might make this kind of um, clock impossible to create. And so when you're trying to span this space, this, you have these different options, but it becomes difficult to, to really get uh, that, that perfect uh, solution. And so um, that sort of covers sort of an example of how this architecture um, has worked together. And I'll just, I'll just advance past my slide here. Okay, there we go. Uh, so I'll just say, uh, I'll just sort of pull back briefly and talk about some of the overarching challenges that we uh, found with, with this, this challenge. So we talked specifically about the, the clock example, but there are sort of overarching challenges we, we identify with all, all, all TNT. Um, and one of the first ones here was that all TNT is, is not a priority. So there's, there's no sort of centralized office right now in the DOD that's really taking on the alt TNT mission. Um, and one of the experts in our in our uh, panel that we that uh, spoke to us about these issues had a great quote in our report that says uh, TNT is everyone's need but nobody's business. So um, it's a sort of ubiquitous need in the DoD, but but um, no centralized office. And so you know one of the options we identified for this is really to increase collaboration and coordination across the DoD. Uh, another challenge we identified is that is really the over reliance and ubiquity. Uh, of GPS. The GPS is everywhere. DOD has said that they want it to remain the cornerstone and these other technologies to complement it. Um, but, uh, but it still has these vulnerabilities. It still has this, this lack of resilience. So one alternative proposal uh, that we ran across was what if you made clocks and inertial sensors the sort of the cornerstone of this and you let other technologies complement that. Well, clocks and inertials might have a more resilient design uh, than GPS, and it would, it would uh, address this over-reliance problem. And that ne wouldn't necessarily, that kind of framework wouldn't necessarily uh, change the technologies you had available. No one would get rid of GPS, no one would get rid of these other technologies, but it might change the priorities with which uh, you develop the, the technologies, and it would, would shift maybe priority towards towards uh, clock and inertial sensors or other technologies that provide a more resilient framework than, uh, than centering around GPS. Uh, another challenge was just unclear performance requirements. I talked sort of about the various platforms that we have here. And, um, and, and one of the issues when you have so many different platforms we found was that uh, you don't define the requirements sort of clearly for every single platform. And because you have this great tool of GPS available to you, you just default to saying, hey, the requirement is whatever GPS can provide with me. And so the solution to that would be, you know, taking an effort to really clarify uh, performance requirements for mission. And, and the last uh, um, challenge we talked about was really a lack of incentives for industry. Um, and it was, it was an interesting conversation because there's sort of this symbiotic relationship between the industrial base and DOD. And DOD has to rely on the industrial base to manufacture these components, um, as we saw with the, with the example of the clock. Um, you know, not having the advanced photonics available really undermines their um, ability to produce some of their more innovative ideas. Um, but there's the other side that where industry might also have ideas or have developed technologies that they're using in the commercial sector for, for all PNT that DOD doesn't have, and they're leveraging a different commercial base. And if DOD could you know uh, had better had coordination with with industry on these things you could wind up with a combined uh, customer base so we we really saw that as uh, there's you know one of the options to sort of address this was to look at it, you know abilities to coordinate with industry and leverage of the advances that industry has made so that sort of gives a bit of an overview of, of what we saw in our report as some of the challenges um, and, re and, and requirements that DOD is looking at in the alternative PNT space. Um, and with that, I will uh, uh, turn it back over to John, and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, I'm happy to take uh, any questions at the end. Great, great. Thank you, Will. I think that um, 
Yeah, there's been uh, some, I guess, oversimplification in the news about what this report said. And I think, yeah, at least for me, you really cleared up a lot of the, the key uh, the key things about what was recommended there. So well, thank you, thank you. So, okay, um, before we go on to our next um, speaker, um, Sophie, maybe we could launch another poll uh, question. Yes, okay, so here we go. Um, we'd like to know what market sector do you work in? And so we listed these here. Our our, our polling tool only gives us um, uh, five choices. So we've had a uh, kind of oversimplify or combined a few things. So obviously uh, aerospace and defense, pretty clear. Scientific, academic, um, another choice, pretty clear. Um, we've lumped together called civilian infrastructure transportation. So if you uh, working in power grid, telecommunications, rail, maritime, automotive, all of those would fit into that category. And then the fourth category is, um, well, I guess I would call the, the centimeter level kind of thing, surveying construction, the professional services, the real um, uh, centimeter or um, things, and then lastly, other. And so uh, there we have our, our results. And okay, great. Uh, and I guess as expected, uh, most people are in aerospace and defense because this was focused on that uh, on that area, uh, on that subject, so it makes perfect sense. Okay, we got the kind of audience I think that will um, uh, line up well. So, so with that, uh, Gregor, uh, over to you. Thanks very much, John. Um, good morning, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much for uh, having us here to you and the uh, Orolia team. Um, trying to click on the slides yeah it, it does take a while to advance i found it's um there um let's see and i think you should have slide control i found that i usually have to click uh on the uh on the screen itself to get the context of the mouse oh i think i see your mouse and there yep. we go okay thank Great. you very much all right, so my name is Gregor Sy Jackson, one of the founders of Jackson Labs Technologies. And uh, today I will be focusing on three actual uh, applications for microatomic clocks in the military uh, space. So a little bit uh, practical uh, in my application. Um, one is uh, military jammers, how microatomic clocks uh, can enable uh, and enhance uh, military jammer performance and, and uh, applications. Uh, the other one is an emerging technology, which is uh, low Earth orbit positioning and timing. And uh, the third one is uh, uh, vehicle retrofits, uh, in particular aircraft, in uh, fully GNSS denied applications. So uh, our first topic is IED jammers, uh, uh, improvised explosive device jammers. Uh, there is a large market for those uh, about 15 years ago um, when the US uh, I was actively engaged in, in, in some uh, 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 areas in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. And uh, why is uh, a microatomic clock needed for uh, an IED jammer and a counter IED jammer? Well, one of the reasons is uh, blue force uh, or adversary jamming signals can swamp the GNSS signals. So if you have a GNSS antenna about you know five inches away from a 50 watt or 100 watt jammer, uh, you're certainly not going to receive any GSS -S signals. Uh, why is that important? Well, um, we need a, a, a tight uh, UTC timing to enable blue force communications. And uh, David Garrigan is going to go into much more detail in that in his coming presentation on why that is the case and exactly what the uh, parameters are that are involved with that. So we're looking for an extended holdover um, to enable blue force communications while, while jamming uh, 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 you know, um, ID uh, uh, trigger signals. The environment we're in is, is dismounted. It's extremely challenging. We have uh, thermal uh, barriers to contend with. We have motion of the operator. We have shock and vibration. Uh, we have short warm-up time requirements where, uh, you know, the, the, the folks that use these uh, units, they want to be able to power them on and quickly go out on a mission. And we also have battery powered operations. So low power is uh, very, very important. So these are extremely challenging compared to a vehicle or stationary application. 
And of course, uh, low power, as I mentioned, is required because these are battery operated. So um, something like a micro rubidium is optimal for this type of application. In terms of uh, holdover performance, I'm going to look at three different uh, clock uh, types. We start off with a legacy CSAC uh, power consumption. Um, depending on which vendor you're looking at is about 120 milliwatts to 180 milliwatts. And here's a typical plot of uh, how a CSAC can operate in stationary conditions over a five day period. You see two typical CSACs and you see there is an exponential curve here um, that's uh, pretty uh, 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 dominant for the aging of the CSAC. And that's caused by actual aging uh, 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 of the CSAC. So aging is, is, a, is a rate of change of frequency over time, and it actually has an exponential effect on, on holdover drift. Maybe you can see one of the units is uh, performing slightly better than the other one, but both, yeah, I think you can kind of see that this is an exponential curve. On the next slide, uh, we're looking at a micro uh, rubidium atomic clock. Uh, we've now gone from about 180 milliwatts to 450 milliwatts of power, which is still uh, extremely low. And uh, this is a pre-production unit which, which we had access to some time ago and we've been doing extensive testing and development with. And you can see here that uh, it's, it's uh, performing a little bit better than the previous units. We're averaging about 900 nanoseconds drift over the first couple of days. And what I wanted to point out here is, is that initially the first three or four days, we're looking at linear drift. And that linear drift is pretty much caused by initial frequency offset uh, um, in, in, in the system, which hadn't been fully calibrated out. And then after about two and a half, three days, we see an exponential uh, component come in here. That, again, is the aging of the unit, uh, which means that the frequency changes over time. It's not just a static offset, which would cause this linear drift. It's actually uh, 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 an, an increasing offset, which then turns into an ex exponentially integrated uh, phase difference. We can see that this is still uh, somewhere around uh, uh, better than a microsecond a day. And the spec for this part is, is uh, 5 to the minus 12, 5 uh, per day. And that spec is what's showing up here after about three days as the red curve. You'd see if, if we just had continued on the linear frequency offset, we would have continued on the yellow curve here. But still, after five days, that's a very small increase. So let's move on to the next slide. This is a, uh, a legacy rubidium. Now we're moving to the, the five to seven and a half watt steady state power consumption, but you can also see how uh, performance increases. Uh, we're looking at um, about four microseconds total drift over 21 days. Here's the first uh, 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 four days of operation. You can see it's, uh, it's uh, in the hundreds of nanoseconds per day kind of drift. But this uh, requires a rubidium that, that powers up above 15 watts uh, uh, warm up state so, uh, and runs at about somewhere between five to seven and a half watts steady state, which might be too much for thermal reasons, but uh, more importantly for battery consumption reasons. Now we move into to the uh, second area of, of, of interest, which is uh, low Earth orbit positioning and timing. Why is atomic clock stability important for that? Um, well, in a typical GNSS system, you have four satellites that are being tracked that, that, that uh, uh, are required to generate your four uh, parameters of interest, which are uh, latitude, longitude, height, as well as time. Um, with a local atomic clock, you only need three satellites because time is provided to you by the clock. Um, so that means that uh, the atomic clock can be used as an input, uh, an additional state in your Kalman PNT filter. Um, you have the advantage of maintaining a local clock that's uh, accurate, and you can thus uh, measure Doppler change, rate of change of the Doppler frequency of the LEO satellite as it passes overhead. We get that into that in a second. That's very important. Um, you could also use it uh, as a spoofing reference. You can compare the uh, satellite provided timing with your local timing and, and if it diverges significantly you can determine spoofing that way um, and it also allows you very accurate carry phase tracking because you have a very stable uh, local reference there's additional information with great details in this article here in inside gnss which uh, i refer you to then the satellis uh, folks 
who have a Leo uh, solution um, commercially available that can ship today uh, allowed us to use this slide. You can see that it's uh, the signal is 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 anywhere between 300 to 2400 times stronger than GPS. So that's another great advantage of of Leo operation. You further also have uh, local spot beams, which allow you uh, proof of location as well as enhance your uh, positioning accuracy. That said, how does a Leo work? A Leo is actually the opposite of a GNSS uh, system, a Leo system. GNSS system requires highly accurate, highly stable local oscillators on the satellite, uh, rubidium or, or cesium uh, beam clocks. And you basically uh, have, have a, a fairly low cost, a very inaccurate local oscillator in your receiver, and you're just comparing all the satellites relative to each other. A LEO constellation works different than that. A LEO satellite will pass overhead in less than 10 minutes from horizon to horizon, so you have very strong uh, Doppler shift because of that fast moving bogey, uh, as well as you have very, very good 3D positioning capability. Um, so what we do is we use multiple shifted pseudo range measurements over those 10 minute intervals. And we, uh, instead of instantaneously arranging all the satellites at the exact same millisecond, which is what we do in GNSS. So we recreate essentially an infinite number of satellites by measuring an infinite number of pseudo ranges from one single satellite. So that's a completely different way to operate versus a GNSS system. And that does require a very, very stable local oscillator clock uh, for the user terminal to work because we're comparing the, the, the timing coming from the satellite versus our atomic clock. That's why local oscillator stability is very important. Uh, our third example is a, a vehicle retrofit operation where we're uh, trying to establish local UTC clock in fully GNSS denied operations. Um, and this is something we can do in aircraft as well as mounted vehicles. Um, we maintain position in the vehicle using a highly accurate INS, and we maintain UTC timing with a microatomic clock. And this leads us to the uh, product, which we call the GPS transcoder, which is a miniaturized GPS simulator that allows us to retrofit existing vehicles without you know, having to replace all the equipment inside the vehicles. There's sometimes up to 10 or more GPS receivers inside a military vehicle that all need to be synchronized and that all need to be keyed. Uh, with this capability, uh, you can do that with one single retrofit. How does that work? Well, in normal operation, we have a GNSS antenna that feeds a GNSS signal to all the avionics of the vehicle, to the GNSS systems on board, as well as to our uh, holdover platform, which is this right here. There's a navigation engine, an enhanced camera filter, and a high-end uh, inertial navigation system. This gets disciplined. Uh, to GNSS during normal operation, meaning we, we continuously reconfigure the INS for truth position and we calibrate the miniature atomic clock to the UTC timing. Now, when we get into a jammed situation, uh, things change and this will happen. We switch over from an external antenna feed to an internal antenna feed. And the microatomic clock sitting on the transcoder right here actually generates a GPS L1CA output signal. Um, that simulates the life sky simulation, uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, constellation based on time from the miniature atomic clock and position from the uh, inertial navigation system. These systems downstream have no idea that they're not receiving a life sky signal, that they're receiving a simulated signal. Uh, moving on, here's an example of a microatomic clock uh, used in a, in a vehicle. Uh, this is a non uh, keyed a zeroized uh, SASM receiver over about uh, 15, 20 minutes of flight time. And you can see how the microatomic clock, which is the red trace, uh, flywheels and filters out all those reflections and uh, uh, disturbances. Uh, we're looking at a reduction from about plus minus 150 nanoseconds peak to peak uh, to somewhere uh, to a standard deviation of about 21 nanoseconds. And my last slide shows. Uh, uh, um, a commercial application of the miniature atomic clock. Uh, this can ship today. Um, pricing is, is, is below $4,000. And the advantages are that uh, there's extensive firmware that enhances clock performance and, and integrates fully integrates GNSS operation, uh, as well as extensive hardware design for reliable plug and play operation, you know, wide uh, power supply range, um, grade filtering. And uh, also we've added uh, 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 ultra low phase noise and aid of pulse filter to this capability to, to, to the microatomic clock to kind of uh, get uh, three 
separate uh, performances out of it. One is phase noise and then ADIF performance and then holdover and then as well as GNSS disciplining from uh, the microatomic clock. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, John. Great, thank you, Gregor. That, that's fascinating. And that, that example you showed of where you can recreate a GNSS signal and, and use it to drive other systems in case uh, you're in denial, that really looks like that's a, a really cool thing as well. Great. Okay, um, let's move on to our last speaker. But before we do that, we have one more, uh, one more poll question. Actually, we, we've combined two questions into one here. Uh, first question, do you use OCXOs? These are oven control crystal oscillators. But I imagine this audience probably knows what that is. And if you have, have you considered microatomic clocks? So two questions built into one, so either uh, no and no, or yes and no, or no and yes, and or yes and yes. So we've combined very efficiently, combined a lot of information into two bits of information. So Claude Shannon would be very proud of us here that we've we've optimized the information transfer. So uh, as you, if you can answer that, this is a pretty straightforward question. Um, that yes, either yes or no. Do you use OCXOs? And number two. Do you, uh, have you ever considered atomic clocks as a replacement? So what do we have results? Um, so let's focus the most people have said, yes, they use OCXOs and yes, they've considered atomic clocks. So half of our, half of our audience, half of our responding audience. So that's great. That's great. Um, and, and, you, and you came to the, came to the right place. So, um, okay. With that, thank you for your responses and we'll go on. David, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, let's see if I can get control of the slides okay here. Um, Perfect. Oh, good. Okay. okay. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm going to get into here um, <clears throat> using uh, miniature atomic clocks specifically. I'm going to talk about radio communications, RF communications, and uh, we'll start by talking about why that is, why holdover is critical um, for these applications. So uh, modern radio communication systems require that the transmitters and the receivers are tightly synchronized. And uh, the reason for this is uh, it allows for frequency hopping, which is unique to military applications. and uh, also, it allows the advanced networking that, that allows for multiple users and the high data rates that we all demand in our wireless communications. Um, <clears throat> in military applications specifically, uh, GPS denial is uh, quite prevalent, and therefore they cannot rely on GPS for synchronization uh, like the commercial applications can. So in the, in the absence of GPS, uh, radios need precise clocks. And, um, you know, the legacy systems um, have waveforms that, that have features in them that maintain synchronization. And, um, you know, there are various techniques for this. There's lots of patents on it. There's lots of um, creative ways to do the synchronization. But the, the one constant thread in all of these methods is that all of these features that they've used to synchronize the clocks to compensate for the, the poor oscillators, the poor holdover of the oscillators, they all limit the data throughput, and that's the, the key issue there. Um, <clears throat> so as an example, I picked some very relevant, very prevalent um, commercial waveforms in being LTE and LTE advanced. And uh, you can see in the table there um, that the requirements for these waveforms is that the oscillators are synchronized to 1.5 microseconds for LTE, and 500 nanoseconds for LTE advanced. And the thing to note there is the trend, right? So as you go to advanced waveforms, in this case, just from LTE to LTE advanced, um, the requirement for synchronization went up by a, three, a factor of three. Um, and, and that is the trend. And it's, it's gonna, you know, as we try and get more out of each and every newer waveform, that number is gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller. And the same trend exists in military waveforms. Um, also in that table is the, is the results of not complying with these. And, and when you don't comply with it, you get packet loss, you get spectral collisions, you get interruption, you'll, you know, you know, 
um, you, you sometimes would even fall off the, the network. And uh, these things are very real in commercial applications and they're also quite applicable to military applications. Okay. <clears throat> Another um, uniquely military application is radio silence. So radio science is known as emissions control or MCON. As they just kind of smushed the two words together. Um, and that is used to prevent soldiers from being detected by the enemy. So when we talk about waveforms in military applications, LPI, LPD is a, is a very common term to discuss that. LPI is low probability of intercept and LPD is low probability of detection. So in MCON mode, we're really looking at the low probability of tech detection piece of it. And so when a user is in MCON mode, um, radio transmissions cannot be used. And this is for obvious reasons. If you're, if you're emitting energy, uh, people can find you. And, we, and in military applications, they don't want people to find them. And therefore, they shut off their transmitters. Um, some radios will have an MCON mode, which just essentially just guarantees that it doesn't emit anything. And <clears throat> because they're not emitting anything, some of these waveforms that require synchronization can't send out their periodic pulses that keep everything in sync. And therefore, if you're in MCON mode for a long period of time, then users can, can, can drift outside of, that, um, outside of that synchronization requirement, you know, which using the example of LTE is the, is the 1.5 microseconds or the 500 nanoseconds. Um, but they will basically, when they turn the radio back on, after being in MCON for a long period of time, um, they will find that they need to register back with the network and these things take a lot of time and they emit a lot of energy and they, they provide an opportunity for the enemy to find them. Um, and that leaves them with the option of using very simple analog waveforms, which are unencrypted. In, in the radio world, they call that plain text. Basically it's unencrypted transmissions and that is dangerous for other reasons. So, Using atomic clocks will allow the users to come out of the MCON mode and then use these advanced waveforms without requiring any um, registration of the network, without any special synchronization modes. All of these things are a, a huge advantage to the, to the soldier when coming out of MCON mode. <clears throat> so here I ran um, some calculations on uh, typical MRO, uh, the, the rubidium uh, oscillator. Um, the OCXOs, as we mentioned before, are the oven-controlled oven crystal oscillators. And TCXO, which is kind of the classic way, um, the classic oscillator used in specifically handheld radios. Um, and the calculations, you know, make some assumptions about the way uh, temperature varies over the life of it, but it's the same assumptions in all three cases. So the calculations would scale. And you can see that with the, uh, the mini rubidium oscillator, you, you have you know, much better than a day in many cases, depending on the synchronization requirements of your waveform. And again, in this case, I use commercial waveforms, LTE and LTE advanced. And, and so you can see how this is a, a, a very strong mission enabler for in many cases. So why does synchronization matter? So here, just getting into kind of the nuts and bolts of waveforms in general. <clears throat> so for both TDMA waveforms, and, and for those who don't know, TDMA is, is time division multiple access. So that's when they slice up the time um, to allow you know, networking essentially. So multiple users you know, can get assigned different time slots. And, um, and so packets can be sent at the precise time. And that allows you to maximize your spectrum um, for various things. And, in military uh, applications also allows for frequency hopping. And uh, yeah, so frequency hopping, for those who don't know, is, is you, you bounce around into all kinds of different frequencies with the, the one radio transmission, as opposed to the, uh, the traditional, we'll say commercial waveform, which only you know, transmits on the frequency that is assigned to them. <clears throat> so for, for both of these, a, a guard band is required. And smaller and fewer guard bands leaves room for more data. And so um, just for those who don't know about guard bands, guard bands allow for the transmitter to ramp up, to ramp down. Um, that's, also, that's referred to as a tack decay in the radio world. Um, but basically, it's the transmitter getting up to power and then coming back down from power. 
and uh, that takes time and that time is not being used to send data which is what really the radio users want right and then the other major factor in in why we can't just use all data all the time is the synchronization between the transmitter and the receiver and that's where the, the holdover is important um, so for systems that you know all systems have imperfect oscillators but some are more perfect than others um, the system will allow for this the the slop in the uh, transmitter receiver so they're not transmitting on top of each other and just wasting that spectrum um, so if you look at the graph on the right it just shows you know while we're synchronizing sending sync pulses or otherwise synchronizing radios we're not transmitting and while we're you know allowing for these guard bands we're not sending the useful data that the uh, that the user wants um, so the more hops or time slots that we use the more guard bands are required. So the guard bands and the sync, that all is needed for every single time you're hopping or time slicing. And again, the trend in waveforms is more time slots, more hopping. And it, it's been steadily moving in that direction for, for many decades. <clears throat> so, here to talk about you know the the, the specs of the MRO uh, that make it uh, ideally suited for defense applications is the superior long time long term drift and we saw that in in the slide the bar graph that I showed earlier about how you can get much better than a day for most uh, waveform requirements and uh, and because of that waveforms can now be designed to remove a lot of those sync pulses and, and to tighten up those guard bands to maximize the amount of data that can be sent. It has a wide operating temperature range of the minus 10 to plus 65 C. Um, <clears throat> and then also it is, it's a much lower cost than a, a, a CSAC, a chip scale atomic clock. And, and at, we believe that this lower price will open the door um, for using atomic clocks in new applications and, and, and we expect that these will really be pushed out into a lot of the different military applications very soon uh, to take advantage of this. And then they also have a low power consumption. So um, Gregor um, mentioned the 450 watt power consumption and, and that's true at five volts, but just note that um, in, at 3.3 volts, you're down to about a third of a watt. And uh, so we're, we're really getting the power down on that and um, it, as compared to a typical OCXO, um, it's about one third the power of an OCXO. So that's the other advantage of uh, mini rubidium. And we for the, try and click again. Okay. <clears throat> so lastly, whoop, I guess I overclicked. Sorry, let me go back. Try to go back. Yeah, it's, okay. it's back, uh, David. It, I think you got a big delay there, so it's yeah. Okay. The last slide now. Great. Yeah, that was me being impatient. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, so the MRO50 is is already being fielded. I um, just want to note that. Um, so we have <clears throat> lots of products. Um, you know, the, the three products that we see down there that the, the that rubidium oscillator is embedded in all three of those products, and it's already been sold and it can, will be continued to be sold. So this has already been proven. Um, in the versus sync versus PNT, and it's been used in ground and airborne applications. And we've done already done null standard A10G and 461G testing um, with that MRO50 embedded inside of the device. So it's it's been a system tests on those, and uh, that's that. I think I am done. Back to you, John. Great, thank you, David. Very, uh, very good and very real life uh, applications. Good to see. So, um, with that, it looks like we have a good amount of time now for questions and answers. So, we'll go to that. But first, I think we have one more poll question. So, I think Sophia will bring that up. Yes. Okay. The so poll question is: Would you like someone from Moroli to contact you after the webinar? So, just answer this yes or no. We won't wait for. Uh, for the response to this. We'll just leave this up so you folks can answer it for a while. 
and um, we'll go on to our, our questions and answers. So um, I, I've got the uh, questions that we received when you registered, I got those in front of me, so I'll start with those. But if you have other ones, looks like we might have enough time. Maybe if you wanna submit other ones online, we might have some time for live questions. So let's uh, first start. The first one I have here is, this is R, the small scale atomic clocks, the atomic transition type or a nuclear type? Um, uh, Will, could you could you help us with that one? Uh, yeah, sure, John. Uh, so so I think they're asking about atomic transitions versus nuclear transitions, and and all the the clocks that we we saw looking at our our report were looking at atomic uh, looking at atomic transitions. Although I will add that there's a couple of different you know variations here there are atomic transitions in the microwave regime which are sort of the classic uh, csac and then there's the optional the optical clock excuse me which are looking at um optical transitions and uh, uh those are about and then at a higher frequency so you go from a microwave frequency to a visible light frequency you can achieve a much better precision with those clocks and and we talked a little bit about um some of those that are that are under development now but but all looking at uh, at atomic transitions. Right. In uh, the 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 optical ones, uh, it's my understanding is that they're not they're not ready for the into this small scale. These are still now the the large scale size for atomic. No one no one's doing a uh, a small scale uh, optical clock yet. Or maybe there's things you can't talk about. Yeah. So so the so. The one that we, uh, the one we we talked about was the optical example I provided here was looking at a rack-mounted unit, so so that was that was certainly true on that that unit that it was still still looking at a larger form factor. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Okay. Um, next question is: What is the top priority for the next generation of small-scale atomic clocks? Current cost is approximately five to six K with a developer kit. What is the price goal? Okay, so I guess I'll leave this um, Gregor or David, either maybe either or both of you want to answer that? Yeah, I, well, I, I can take this. Uh, um, yeah, go ahead, yeah. David. Yeah, so atomic clocks are, are starting to become more of a commodity. So we're, we're seeing the prices trending downward over time. Um, but you know they will ultimately be driven by market conditions, and as as I mentioned in my slides, I, I think with the price coming down, that will allow for uh, more use of them in applications, and that should increase the demand and increase uh, the supply, which should help drive that price down. So okay. I, I guess I'll I'll use the usual uh, disclaimer with you know past past performance does not uh, guarantee future um, success. Okay. Oh, you should be, you should be an investment firm, David. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 very uh, 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 well put. Um, yeah, from our perspective, we we of course we sell modules rather than components. Um, like I mentioned in one of my slides, the advantages you get a turnkey system that you just apply power to, rather than having to design software and hardware around it and a circuit board and so on. But um, for uh, for module pricing, starts anywhere around in small quantities, 3,800 to somewhere around 6,500, depending on the capability of the clock and, and what else is there and, and whether it's ruggedized and, and extended temperature or not. So, so that's kind of the price range is uh, small quantities starts at slightly below $4,000. And uh, we're also hoping for pricing to, to go down over time. Unfortunately, right now, obviously, uh, Everybody's seeing component shortages. Um, I'm hearing it from from all of our, our suppliers. You know, something that used to be seven dollars, uh, microcontroller seven dollars at the beginning of the year. Three months later, now is fifty-seven dollars a piece and in very large quantities. So, so we're kind of keeping an eye on that, and we're hoping that those shortages will go go away uh, toward the end of the year. But we're still maintaining our pricing, uh, as I just mentioned. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Um, Next question is, um, what are the improvements with respect to previous CSEC versions? Um, 
Gregor, I, I imagine you probably have the most experience with CSAC of the group here. Would you like to do that sure. one? Sure. Yeah, I can take that. Um, I try to kind of show the three different performance levels um, uh, relative to power consumption. Uh, sizing is about the same. Um, but certainly, uh, uh, you can see that there's a lot less uh, daily aging, which I was showing in the exponential growth of, of drift over time um, in, the, in the newer clocks. Um, the higher up you go, um, the better that performance is, but also the higher your power consumption, of course, is. Um, uh, a lifetime is certainly uh, an improvement, I believe, uh, for some of these clocks, as well as uh, power consumption size, um, uh, a price, uh, and also other factors like uh, short-term stability, ADEF, and phase noise um, improvements are there as well. So those are kind of the improvements that we see. Uh, you know, from the different vendors that make these clocks. Great, great, thank you. Okay, uh, next question. Please clarify what is available now and what is planned for later. Um, uh, Will, maybe you, you could start us off with that of, based on what you looked at a pretty wide survey. Uh, what is available now and what is planned for later? Yeah, so our scope uh, looked at um, sort of near-term emerging technologies, I would say. So, so the types of things that we were thinking about, um, we're looking at what's in DoD's R&D portfolio and, and, and where they're going. So the types of things I talked about, like improved performance and manufacturability of, of, of chip scale clocks, um, you know these these rack mounted optical clocks um potential hybrid designs um i think those are the things that are that are sort of uh, forward looking in terms of the current market stuff i would i would say the other panelists are probably uh better to to talk about what uh, you know what what the current market state is but but those are the types of things that that we saw um are are emerging in in the in the r d portfolio great Great. Um, uh, Gregor, David, would you like to add anything? Yeah. Uh, I just, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, David. Okay. Yeah, I, I just, um, as, as stated in, in my presentation, the, the MRO 50 is, I mean, you could place an order today. Um, it, it, they're, they've already been fielded. Um, we, we are embedding them into our products and, and selling them, and we've sold them. I can't remember can't remember the date when we sold the first one, but it was I would say middle of 2020. Great. Yeah, from, from our point of view, um, um, holdover and thermal range, as well as short-term stability and warm-up time improvements, are are things that are uh, uh, starting to ship right now. Uh, much improved over previous versions of the units. Um, sometimes by orders of magnitude is what we're seeing. And Great. those are either shipping now or will be shipping in the next six months. Okay. Great. Great. Um, there are now a number of these questions which are generally asking what's the temperature stability performance, what is the size, weight, power. I, I guess for these things, instead of us having to read off of spec sheets and that, I just refer um, uh, re refer our audience to look at the websites of of Jackson Labs in uh, Rolia and and the look at the spec sheets and you get you can get detailed specs on that. So I'm not going to read over those things. Um, let's see. Next uh, question I have here is a proof of concept prototype for ground forces position 40 meters CEP accuracy with celestial bodies. Is it relevant? Um, I, so I don't know if I fully understand that question. Does any, any of our speakers, you, you want to comment on that one? I, I can comment on that, John. Um, I think what they might be looking at is, is, is celestial tracking and satellite tracking with optical means. Uh, I, I think that's how I understand the, the question. Um, that's certainly something that's, that's being worked on. There are solutions there, atomic clocks that help those kind of solutions, like like I mentioned, it's similar to the Leo constellation, where the atomic clock gives you the capability to do multiple measurements over uh, periods of time and compare um, uh, pseudo range from from the different bodies you're looking at. 
um, over time and, and, and measure pseudo range. And of course, one nanosecond uh, is, is one foot of inaccuracy. So, so the customer's question or the, the uh, audience question was uh, 30, th was it 30 meters? That, that would be about a hundred nanosecond kind of timing accuracy. Um, and uh, there are there are ways to do that uh, by by either sa uh, tracking satellite bodies if you know the ephemeris uh, and I'm talking about visually tracking optically tracking satellites with either lasers or optical sensors. So that's something that's being worked on and and that will be available commercially uh, probably in the next year or two. Okay, great. Yeah, John, uh, uh, I'll just add to that 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 was uh, that was not something I talked about. Here, but that's definitely something we looked at in our report as well. Um, on the other side of looking at at, at celestial tracking, and um, one of the efforts we looked at was an automated um, celestial tracking system, looking at, at as Gregor said, at at both stars and and uh, reflections or or tracking of satellites. Um, and yeah, I think we saw a similar performance to to what is mentioned here, which is you know you had first of all you had night and day operation and with the automated system you were able to get about about 50 meters is what we we quoted in in the report on that so that's that's definitely part of that and i think that you know is that relevant uh, i think that that's that's part of what we saw as sort of the larger overall picture of combining these absolute and relative solutions is that um having that external signal allows you to ultimately you know reset your your uh your inertial system uh, on board a on board a platform, and so you know that that complementary piece of working together. Those are those are definitely part of the part of the puzzle that we're seeing in the DoD right now. Okay, great, great. Now that now that makes sense to me. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we just have time for maybe one more question here. Um, this one is: uh, Defense products uh, have a long life cycle. Uh, can you give an indication of these components uh, product life cycle? How long are these? Um, I guess, you know, I, I'm going to uh, offer a, 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 an answer to that based on what our folks are always telling me when I'm trying to put something into a bid and, okay, the uh, military defense applications always require these, you know, long 10-year kind of life cycles, but then they also want the latest technology and what my guys tell tell me is they say we'll tell them just to buy a lot okay buy, buy a lot of them and then we'll keep we'll keep the product alive for a long time so um i don't know if uh uh, uh our other speakers you have any any comments uh, uh on that one um yeah for us uh, we we've we've been selling chipsky atomic clocks since 2010 in uh, partnership with uh, other vendors, and and we, uh, the big advantage of buying a module rather than a component is is that we adjust these modules to changing uh, component availability, and, and 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 the customer doesn't see that. The interfaces are the same, the software is the same, even though internally we might be going to different components, even different oscillators, and and putting in the latest generation oscillator we're, we're swapping over from one generation to a next generation of the uh, high-end rubidiums right now as we speak for example and that'll be completely transparent even though our software and hardware changed internally uh, externally the user won't see anything except the higher performance so so we expect to be selling these modules that we have on the list right now uh, for the next five to ten years uh, sometimes things become obsolete like the SASM modules that that we sell are are now being uh, of course uh, discontinued by the end of this year um, but we will be able to provide those for for uh, several years after because uh, there's stock available um, that the government is is, is, is putting on hold um, and uh, moving away from there we'll have form fit and function compatible modules with encode for example that will replace the SASM modules so the customer uh, will be able to buy them exactly like you said, John. As long as there's a market, we will continue making. That's great. That's a that's a great solution. A great real value add to 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 solve that conundrum of you know how do you keep the latest technology and then but keep it alive for a long period. That, that that's a great solution. Thanks. Well, I think that's all we have. We're approaching the top of the hour. Uh, that's all the time. We uh, have, I want to thank our speakers for a very interesting um, uh, 
presentation here. Um, do we have any other closing remarks that we need to make to you folks? Um, you will um, you will receive an email uh, about um, about this presentation with links so that you can uh, find it, and we'll look for you to join us at our next uh, coffee talk uh, coming up soon. Uh, thank you all for participating. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.